welcome to the Philly Blunt Bluntcast. My name is Johnny Goodtimes. I'm Reef. Hey, this is Craig. And great to have you here with us on yet another Friday night. And we have a, a guest this weekend is a internationally renowned photographer. I want to welcome Kyle Cassidy to the show. Kyle, welcome. Hi, everybody. Up, Thanks, for, Thanks welcome, for having Kyle. me. Thanks yeah. for coming. Thank you. Uh, wanted to kind of, uh, you know, we kind of every week, I guess, we're sort of talking to people about how they're adapting and especially with their jobs. We've talked to people in the restaurant business, people in the music business, so forth. How has this changed uh, the photography business? Um, well, I, I think in a lot of ways, it's kind of ended a lot of people's photography business. And, you know, photography is like, it's a it's a big thing, and that's what what's always made it interesting to me is that whatever you happen to be interested in, you could add photography to that. So you know, if you like trains, you could add photography to that and photograph trains. If you like, you know, people, you could um, add photography to that and photograph people. And if you like nature, you add photography to that and you photograph nature. Um, but I think that the a lot of you know the traditional money generating uses of photography involve people getting together um in groups a lot of times so i think that for a lot of my uh colleagues and peers it's made that difficult for them and there are a lot there are photographers who are trying to do other things around that and I, i've noticed that there's a a group of photographers doing um like family portraits on people's porches yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you know they'll come to your street you get out on your you know, your porch. And uh, it, it's interesting to see how not just photography, but all, you know, all, uh, all professions are sort of figuring out what this new way of doing things is. So it's been interesting and sometimes uplifting to see that. And then there are people, you know, there are news photographers who are still out there every, every day, you know, I'm watching these, uh, you know the um the broadcast from the white house you know and there are the photographers there from the washington post and the new york times and everything's still making great photos and you know doing what they do but doing it in a different way i saw a really interesting picture of um mitch mcconnell surrounded by like six photographers and they're all you know 10 feet away from him just in this circle taking pictures while he stands in the middle of this room and talks so like things have changed um and the way that people are doing things have changed for sure. Now, if they if they if we get the uh, the okay that we're allowed to go back to normal, so to speak, do you find do you think you'll jump right back into the mix, or do you think you might take some hesitation now? Because photographers are in the pit; they're up close and personal, yeah, getting the sweat sure. on them, you know. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, I I don't know that I'll ever be the same again after this. <laughs> you know. Um, I was, Amen, I, man. you know, I went to the, you know, the local beer store like a week and a half ago and I was in there and I'm talking to the, you know, the bartender who I know and I'm standing a good, you know, 10 feet back and we're having a little conversation and it was nice to sort of see another person again. And then other people walked in and they just like came right past me and I'm like, I got to get out of here. You know, I'm having a panic attack. <laughs> it's so nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I don't know that every, you know, that, that anything's ever going to be the same again but one of the things that i've you know been thinking about doing is like you know how do i adapt to this thing and i, I was thinking that i would like to do um well because at the end of this you know how are we going to remember this time apart and um upstairs like hanging on my wall i have the, my grandmother's uh air raid sign that was in her house during world war ii and you know she just had it there and had to be posted in everybody's house and i have her book of ration coupons her last <laughs> book of ration coupons from world war ii and i'm, I'm thinking about now like how are we going to remember this time you know to our children and grandchildren so i've been thinking that i would like to do portraits of couples with their their homemade masks um mm, you know I sort of sort of celebrating the fact that they're that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing so that you know 15 years from now or 20 years from now they can say oh 
this was that time that you might not re, you know might not have heard about or not, not remember but we were locked down for eight months or you know however long Jesus it is christ settle down <laughs> settle down <laughs> I mean, you look like you're enjoying it you're all laid back with like a bamboo chair i mean you might be looking for eight months <laughs> it's a it's a very realistic outlook man unfortunately yeah. There's, but a, this, there's there's the photo from the last pandemic that I always associated. That was always the picture that entered my mind whenever I thought about the Spanish flu. It was it's like a it's like a police officer with a baton and he's got the mask on mm-hmm. and like he's in front of like he's in front of a of a like a sign that said spit means death or something like that. And I always like that was always the the image in my mind when I think about that. Like like do you you know, when we talk about all of a sudden, it was, it was always like, what could that have possibly been like whenever I'd see photos of Spanish flu and to actually live it now? Like, yeah. is, is there a part of you that's like, OK, I want to capture images that are going to be 100 years from now, what people associate with this thing? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that I'm drawn to photography because I'm afraid of forgetting things. Uh, and, and I think we all are to some extent i think you know that's the the reason that we're afraid of dying because we're we are the only custodians of our memories Mm. and if that goes away then suddenly like my life isn't you know isn't important because it's not remembered so uh i think that i am really compelled to try and remember things and try and write things down and and photography has done that for me and so uh you know, one of the things that I've been trying to do now is keep a record of the the things and the and the people, uh, you know, of this weird time that we, you know, don't understand. And it's, and while, you know, for some of us, it's just like, oh, I'm going to hang out in my, you know, living room and whatever for however long, but other people are dying, you know, right, right, right. Like they're, there are people literally dying, and then there are people who are every day going out, physically putting themselves between, you know, me and in my basement, and and these people who are dying, right. trying to prevent me from dying. And yeah. you know, I feel that I feel that yeah. hard, yeah. and I want to do what I can to try and I don't know, you know, point the applause in, For sure. For in the sure. right direction. For sure. You know, and certainly, you know, like uh, what's getting a lot of the applause right now is, you know, like you know, Tiger King's getting a lot of applause. And, you know, people on Netflix who, who are doing kind of heroic work of keeping us entertained. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I don't want people to, like, I, I don't want that to become my life. It's like, oh, I was distracted for eight months. Right. You know, I, I feel compelled to say well you know you might be having a terrific time on netflix and and catching up on the books that you always wanted to read but there are people who could be doing that but instead they're going to a hospital every day and they're interacting with people have this disease and they're uh, you know and they're bringing your groceries to your door and you know they're doing all all these other things so i feel a a need a desperate need to do that so so what are you beautiful man when you, when you when you say that like what what are you doing like what is your day looking like are you going out and hitting the streets and taking photos of different neighborhoods or what does your day look like so bef- before this all happened i'd been working with a, a lot of nurses for for several years and so i know a lot of nurses and i've been to medical conventions and things like that and so when this happened i thought like well I just want to photograph a bunch of nurses who are like, you know, on the front lines and they're, and they're doing this. And so I started doing portraits of nurses and usually like on their way to work at like, you know, six 30 in the morning or whatever. So I would, you know, meet somebody somewhere along the way and I would uh, do a portrait of them. And I was thinking very early on in this, like, I'm just going to do, portraits of these heroes and I'm going to think of them as heroes because you know I I guess in my mind a hero has a choice to do something or not like you do something heroic because you can decide not to do it Um, which is what drew me to nurses and then I realized along the way that you know 
my thinking was very myopic and that there are also other people who are putting themselves physically between us and this virus and maybe they don't have a choice uh you know they're your instacart shopper and they're um the person who's working at the you know cvs taking your Mm -hmm you know, credit card when you're trying to buy hand sanitizer or whatever. And so I wanted to start photographing these people too, but the, for me, the definition of like what they are is um, not clear and confusing, you know, because a lot of people are forced by financial circumstances to stay outside of their house and do things. Whereas, you know, these nurses who I've been working with for years are like, oh, I'm going to go into this dangerous environment because this is what I've decided to do for my entire life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the person who's selling you toilet paper at the Acme didn't sign up for that. Right. 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 That's a very, 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 very uh, true point. Yeah. So, you know, that just changed my, my sort of framing of the, the whole thing. Am I thinking about, the, you know, who are the people that I'm photographing and, you know, some some people are genuinely heroic and some people I think are hostages of circumstance. Does that make them in, in a certain sense heroic though, or is it more unfortunate than heroic? Well, I, I think that that might not be for me to decide, mm -hmm. you know, if you tell somebody, Oh, go over there and defuse that bomb and they get blown up. You know, and then you're going to say like, well, I'm going to call you a hero. They might not have, have wanted to make that transaction. Gotcha. So I'm, uh, what I'm concerned about my language and I don't want us to, to, you know, jump into things too quickly. I, I think that what I need to do is listen to people and where I can help people tell their own stories. Mm. And I think that's what photography uh, is very good at, mm. like helping people to tell stories. Um, Do you have people reaching out to you and suggesting people or uh, careers or workers? or? I do, um, but not as many people as, as I would like to. So um, my website is kylecassidy.com. <laughs> if people want to find me on there. And I'm in West Philly. And... I want to be able to walk to everybody that I'm photographing um, partially because I want to make this sort of my neighborhood's response uh, to COVID-19 and partially, and also partially because I want to do my part by like not getting on a bus that somebody needs to get on, you know, to get to the hospital to do their job as a doctor or a nurse or uh, custodial staff there or whatever. So, you know, if you're in or near West Philly and you think I should be photographing you uh, or somebody that you know, you know, please certainly hit me up. Did, did, anybody, did anybody see the visual today of um, the guy getting ripped off the bus because he wouldn't, yeah. didn't have a mask? Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy visual. And then, like, you don't know who you're sympathetic towards because, yeah, it's an overreaction. But then is it because SEPTA people are getting COVID and they're just trying to protect the driver and the other passengers. It's a whole confusing scene. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was pretty heavy. I mean, the guy got, uh, obviously it was, it was overkill. Uh, you yeah. know, let's be honest. I mean, you know, if, if the guys, if you've got to kick a guy off the bus, you can kick a guy off a bus. You don't need 10 cops to kick a guy off a bus. Right, right. Yep. And also, I'd like to see, uh, you know, eventually in during all this in a society where they just kind of show up and have masks and gloves for you. You know what I mean? Like that, right. that kind of yeah. makes more sense to me. Because yeah. they're yeah. touching, yeah. they're touching, they're all around each other. They don't have gloves yeah. on. Right. Like you I made it more, you made it more, you made it less safe. Yeah, <laughs> I was in a grocery store yeah. today. You think, you think that 10 cops were going to show up? and arrest the, or, or, or manhandle the people that were in the grocery store without masks? Right. right. No, they were going to do that to people that are on a SEPTA bus. Let's be honest. Right. They were yeah, yeah. They're not doing that whole food. Besides SEPTA who are a lot of times on the front lines of this whole thing because the lower yep. middle class, and not to get too deep, but the lower middle class is the one that's, they're the ones going to war for us. Right. They're the ones yeah. that are going into grocery stores and they're the ones that are going into, uh, you know, a lot of jobs that they have no choice 
And that's the people that you're going to have 10 cops around the bus. I was pretty heated about it, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah, like I said, we just need like, okay, we need, people need to, we need to educate ourselves a little bit more about what is required, where you go, because there have been times where I've gone into stores that required that you come in with a mask or at least ask that you do. Some places don't. So it's becoming less and less about what you think and, and more about have a set of rules that we all need to try to follow because otherwise people are going to just keep being confused. I don't know if that guy knew or not that he needed to have a mask to ride the bus. Right, I don't think he knew. I don't think anybody did because I don't think, <laughs> I think that, that rule they just passed like this morning or something. That's what was crazy about it. And also, why are 10 cops going to endanger their own safety standing next to each other, getting on a bus? <laughs> You know, I, right. I think that there are better ways to do something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're, once again, we're talking to Kyle Cassidy. Kyle's done several books of photography. He's done several uh, uh, photographic essays. And I want to talk to you about a couple of the things you've worked on in the past, Kyle, as well as talk about what you're working on now. But, mm -hmm. you, you know, one thing that you did that was really interesting and, and we're seeing now is there seems to be a lot of growth in terms of the purchase of guns. Mm -hmm. And you wrote a book, or you did a you had a photography book about gun owners. Tell us mm -hmm. how that came about. Yeah, that was in I think it was two thousand four, and I was at a dinner party, and it was just after the election. This was the Bush Gore election, and I think Gore just I think it was, was it Bush Gore, and Gore just lost. No, no, Kerry. It was Kerry. Yeah, so Kerry had just lost, and. I was sitting next to this guy who turned out to be a political operative and he worked for one of the candidates and he said, well, my job was to help wrangle the gun vote. And I was like, what, that's a job? <laughs> like, you, you, like I, you know, you can get a job doing this. And uh, he said, oh yeah. And uh, he started talking to me about, uh, the things that they were doing to try and get gun owners to vote for, for their particular candidate. And I realized it wasn't something that I had thought about a lot, um, like why people owned guns. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to get in a car, drive across America and meet gun owners and ask them why they had a gun. And <laughs> so I did that. I spent two years uh, driving across. I think I wouldn't make it past like the second stop, you know? <laughs> <laughs> probably be dead on someone's lawn yeah. <laughs> but continue <laughs> and you know so it turned into a very popular book called armed america portraits of gun owners in their homes uh, well what was the reaction i mean that's a pretty radical thing you know just you can't just say i hopped in a car and i went across country and took pictures of people in their homes with their guns like yeah if you knock on a door of a gun owner <laughs> i kind of think that's a little bit intense yeah how did okay, you how did yeah. you get the people to participate i guess so yeah i realize i i yada 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 over <laughs> a lot of that there. Um, so when it first happened i was like oh there's you know i looked in the phone book and there were uh you know two gun stores in philly and i was like i'll just go to this gun store i went to this gun store and i was like hey can you you know i'm a I'm a, an unbiased journalist. Can you introduce me to some gun owners so I can take pictures of them? And they were like, get out of here, Sarah Brady. And I was like, oh, man, I guess I got to be more careful. Um, so I went to the the other gun store, and I was like, I would like to buy a gun. And they're like, oh, we would like to help you. And like one of the things that I... I, you know, I, 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 it was a big learning process for me. One of the things that I realized early on in doing this is I didn't want this to be a fish out of water story. Like I didn't want this to be like, oh my God, they're hanging out with these crazy people, you know? And so I bought a gun and I, and I started practicing like I was trying out for the Olympics. I was at the gun range three times a week and I have every target that I ever shot there. Um, Did you get good? I, I did so <laughs> so it, it's it's super interesting to look at the targets and see the pattern just get smaller and smaller and smaller and i s went to the bookstore and i subscribed to every gun magazine that they had and then i th i probably waited a year i think so i was i was doing this for a long time um before I finally started 
seriously asking people. And by then it was, you know, the first people that I talked to were people who I had seen in the gun range, you know, 50 times or whatever. Yeah. So, Cause... and once I had, once I had like 10 portraits um, that I could show to people and they could just flip through it and see exactly what I was doing, then it just got so much easier. Can I, can I bring up this one? Let me see if this yeah. screen, screen share works. Because this guy, this is one of my favorites of this one. You guys see that with all the Domino's pizzas in the <laughs> yeah. back? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, so um, that, that's Dan, who's, who's a computer programmer. He was awesome. Um, I really liked him. Uh, we spent a lot of time together at the, the gun range. And when I, I went to photograph him, my girlfriend at the time was with me. And I'd set up, he had, he had had that stuff set up when I got there and I put my camera there and I was like, let me just move these pizza boxes. And my girlfriend was like, what, are you crazy? Move the pizza boxes. And I was like, it's kind of cluttering the shot. And I took the picture with the pizza boxes in there and it turned out like to be iconic. Yeah, the yeah. best yeah. thing. Right. Cause I mean, that's what his, that's what his life was like. He was a computer programmer. He was very meticulous. He lived alone. He ordered pizza, you know, and then he, you know, recycled on whatever day. And I think that having that in there, it was a much, you know, better picture than oh, yeah. if I had. It humanizes you know, it more than just a guy sitting there with the Oxford shirt and, you know, right. and guns. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. And I, I learned a lot in that. Um, I was a much better photographer going out than I was going in. And initially when i would go to people's houses and and their house was a mess i'd be like oh my god you knew for four weeks that i was coming <laughs> <laughs> and so initially i was annoyed but then i realized that those are the much better photographs because those are the ones you could spend more time looking at and going like ah mm. what are those dvds on the table or right, like well you know what's yeah, that over right, there or right. and i realized that if somebody came to my house and they're like oh you know i want to see what your house is like and if i cleaned it for two weeks beforehand like that wouldn't be really that wouldn't really be me right yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want to see what my life is like then you know you're gonna see whatever dirty laundry i have laying around or you know whatever was there the, the was, reality, there like, the, was there interviews that went along with each photo yes. or context okay yeah so i asked every person just one question why do you have a gun and then that text went along with their picture did you go into it with any preconceived notions in the gun control debate? And did you come out of it with different ideas about that debate? I went into it not having thought about it very much. And I came out of it having thought about it a lot. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, so my views on it are very complex. I realized also that there, I think there are 255 people in that, 256 people in that book, and that I'm the only person who, only person on earth who's met them all. Right, right. Uh, right. So, you know, I have all, all of their stories are, you know, <laughs> swirling around uh, in my head, and, you know, I'm friends with a large number of those people still, and it's been, you know, right. years. A lot of those people, you know, make up uh, a lot of the people who I still talk to on Facebook, and it's been... <laughs> very interesting to just be almost randomly connected to people mm -hmm. and right. then be able to follow their lives mm -hmm. for years yeah, that's great so, do you do you still own your piece i do i do nice. i have not shot it in quite some time um are you who that thing on it what <laughs> are you having it right now <laughs> no no this is uh <laughs> the, my norwal <laughs> I, I, believe, I believe you man <laughs> Was the only one that thought he was about to grab it? No, I thought he was going to I have it right here. I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to shoot my computer. No, but one of the... <laughs> he means badass. business with that headset on. Don't fuck with him. <laughs> that would have been so badass, though. Like, yeah, <laughs> I still do. <laughs> As a swift aside... Um, mm. <laughs> Maybe it won't be so swift, but every time somebody asked me what I was doing this book, every time somebody said, do you want to shoot this gun or a gun or go mm -hmm. shooting? I always said yes. Okay. And 
And so I had a lot of extraordinary ex- experiences. Mm-hmm. I shot a lot of guns. And there was one person who took me shooting something called sporting clays, which is, is a combination of skeet and miniature golf. And <laughs> I found it to be the cool, you know, the coolest sport that I have ever right. participated in. So there are. I got to look that up. <laughs> there are. Th- Thirteen stations or so set up around a mile long course, mm-hmm. and at each one of them there are two clay pigeons that come, and they can come from different directions. So one might come towards you, one might come from behind you, one might come from the left, one might come from the right, and they re- they reset these every week, and and then you have to try and shoot both of them with a shotgun. And I don't know, I just like this is freaking great. I'm walking a mile, <laughs> you know, it's like every one of these things is a challenge. I either hit it or I miss it. I get, you know, better. And there's, you know, the uh there's all and like I'm a photographer, right? So I love gear, I love, you know, lenses and metal things and stuff like that. And I'm like, all right, well, which choke do I use on the shotgun for you know the the close pigeon and then then you get the far pigeon. So I enjoyed that a great deal, and mm. I shot a lot of that. And if you know somebody were to ask me tomorrow, do you want to go shoot sporting clays? You would go. I would. I'll yeah. be right there. You said, uh, you just said that you, you know, you like lenses, gear, all that other stuff. Mm-hmm. What, is, what is your take as someone that has dedicated their life to photography to the Instagram iPhone photographer? I'm astounded at the quality of uh, <laughs> of a lot of the camera phones Mm -hmm. you know and i think a lot of a lot of pro photographers now i think are actually shooting Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. some amount of their their stuff on their cell phone which has is that is that because of the filters do the filters really make it look better than it is sometimes um there you know there's an app called hipstamatic which which came out a few years ago and i thought Mm -hmm. their filter process was just really astounding it looked beautiful like everything you took on the hipstamatic i was god it looks great i don't know why i can't do that with my very expensive (laughs) camera (laughs) yeah but um but what are what the filters are doing this sort of is that they're making it low fidelity you know so it's Mm -hmm. kind of easier to it's easier to do if you don't have to do everything as as sharp mm-hmm. um but camera technology on phones is astounding i think instagram is a wonderful thing there are lots of people on instagram mm-hmm. who i follow mm-hmm. who i think are super clever and probably don't have expensive fancy equipment mm-hmm. and you know as as an artist first and a photographer second i think that the most important thing is to have a, an idea the mm-hmm. idea is more important than the equipment okay and I think that Instagram really shows that off. You have some, you know, 16-year-old in Albuquerque right. sitting in their bedroom saying, I'm going to make some amazing art out of, you know, stuffed animals and mm. pencils and, I don't know, whatever else or whatever's in my backyard. So yeah. well, how, how can you as a professional break through that? I mean, that's a lot of, yeah, that's really cool that more people are able to become artists, but it's also creates a lot more clutter that you have to try to break through, right? It does. Um, And I think that there are Instagram photographers who are always gonna have, uh, you know, better reaction uh, than my stuff to a lot of things. But I think that, that what I am hopefully contributing to my photos is a depth of idea behind them. So if I'm going to photograph, you know, 80 nurses or 100 nurses or 20 nurses or whatever during this pandemic and talk to them, then that's going to be something that I'm going to be able to offer to the field of photography that, you know, maybe somebody with a lot of Instagram followers who's doing something different won't necessarily be contributing in the same way so you know we're all playing different instruments in this orchestra yeah you you did a book on librarians that was Mm -hmm. a pretty uh, radical uh, 180 from uh, gun owners what was the uh, what was the inspiration behind that so i got a message on twitter uh from a Dude, library. his stuff is like the most random stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I got a message from right, Twitter. Well, turned just, into I a whole project. Guns for three years. Why don't I go yeah, hang yeah. out at some libraries? Right. <laughs> yeah, I got a message on Twitter uh, from a librarian named Melody Gonzalez, who said, uh, "Librarians are going to be in your town." P.S. We're very photogenic. 
<laughs> and this was the American Library Association was having their midwinter convention in Philadelphia. And it might have been 2016. I can't remember what what year it was. Well, whenever, and, whenever it happens again, let me know. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was actually just in Philly this year. So you did miss it. Um, uh, I'm one of them, one of those guys, you know? Yeah, My yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like it, yeah. So I said, oh, hook me up. And I went and I photographed 20 or 30, I can't remember exactly, librarians and just asked them, uh, you know, what, what don't people know about libraries? And I wasn't sure what was going to happen a second. with Wait. it. I can't remember what, what. and I event, I put this uh, collection of pictures together with interviews and I sent them to Slate magazine. I was like, I thought, I thought this might be an interesting photo essay and they printed it and it went crazy viral. And I think for a while it was the most popular photo essay they had ever done mm. because people were sharing it and they were suddenly remembering librarians who had meant something to them in their past or librarians that meant something to them now and then it turned into a book and i went i spent another year and a half or so photographing more librarians um maybe it was two years and i ended up photographing doing portraits of 300 librarians and doing interviews with each of them. And that's I, it's a lovely book. And I don't think that that book is actually necessarily much different than Armed America. How so? Well, I think, I, I think that whoa, whoa, whoa. both of them, I'm just moving my legs, sorry. Um, I think that both of them are just, um, they're just windows into a into a place um and i think as a photographer you can either tell stories you can help people tell stories and so i think in both of those cases i was just helping people tell their stories um but in the one case the, go ahead oh one of the things um from that book that i've learned through you is the importance libraries play in certain communities Mm -hmm. And with them being shut down now, for the most part, like right. that could be pretty devastating on some of the communities that you've learned about. Yeah, <clears throat> for sure. Um, yeah, when I was um, working with nurses recently, I had I had helped make a a virtual reality film that trained people how to use Narcan, the the opioid what? overdose reversal agent, mm -hmm. and we. Uh, tested it in some libraries uh during narcan day <clears throat> and i went to some i think i went to three different libraries while we were doing that <clears throat> and some of them filled up in the early afternoon when schools let out uh with kids who were waiting for their parents to get done work because the schools let out earlier than work mm -hmm. and so you know, in some of those libraries where I was hanging out just recently, the libraries were performing, uh, you know, not necessarily the job of babysitter, but the, they were performing a valuable function in between the school and work life of a parent. So the parent could say, I will pick you up from the library because I get done work an hour after you get done school. And that's something that I think we don't typically think that libraries do. Mm -hmm. um, we think that libraries give out books and libraries do sometimes give out books, but there are libraries all around the country doing so many other things apart from giving out books. <clears throat> and libraries are giving out things right now during this pandemic, even though they're closed. And I have been using the Philadelphia Public Library every day since the pandemic started i've been taking out audiobooks using their app libby which is made by overdrive Good so, info, I'll man. Mm -hmm. so i'll take an audiobook out every night and i will listen to that audiobook um they also have movies 
There's an app called Hoopla, which your library with Philadelphia Free Library also uh, has. And you can take out comic books through Hoopla. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Mm. So if you want to read a comic book, um, you could get the whole subscription and read it on your iPad. You could read it on your phone if you wanted to. And you could read it on your, <laughs> your computer. And there's uh, this uh, comic book technology that will zoom into panels if you want. So you can have the each panel fill the whole screen. So you don't need a, a giant monitor to view it on. Uh, yes. So, I mean, I think it's important that that, uh, that that knowledge get out, right? Because I think that we have a segment of this uh, country that wants to basically destroy anything that's run by the government and including libraries. I mean, I'm sure people, I'm sure there's got to be a, a movement of people that are just furious that oh yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. In fact, in, the, in my, my book, which is called This is What a Librarian Looks Like, uh, there are a number of chapters that I wrote about specific things that libraries were doing. And then there are a uh, a number of authors who also wrote essays about uh, libra how libraries were important to them. So Neil Gaiman wrote an essay, and Jeff Vandermeer, who wrote Annihilation and Born, wrote an essay. Um, George R. R. Martin, who wrote Game of Thrones, uh, wrote an essay for it. Amy Dickinson, um, who's asking Amy, the advice columnist, she wrote a, an essay for it. But um, one of the chapters, is about a small library, the MN Spear Library in Massachusetts that had an opportunity to increase the size of their library. They're one of the smallest libraries in America. And the state said, if you can get $100,000, we'll give you $100,000, I'm not sure the, the exact amount. And you can you know, build this new library. And the city said, all right, so we're gonna put this like, you know, 78 cent tax on everybody in the town and the town flipped out and they're like, no way, we are not gonna do this. And there's this an enormous back and forth uh, between the voting advocates or the, the library advocates and the anti-tax advocates, uh, which goes on for years and has, uh, and, and the, the, the number of votes are like two or three uh, each way because it's so closely tied, it's a nail biter. Um, but I was surprised at the number of people who were not happy about supporting libraries. And I realized that when I was making this book, that it was, this book is not for librarians. It's for that uncle at your Thanksgiving dinner who's complaining about libraries. Like, that's the <laughs> right, Which is a really <laughs> weird thing to complain about. <laughs> right. You know? right. Yeah. Right. But, so, right. so this yeah. library, the MN Spear Library, since their space was so small, their, their librarian was thinking, well, what can we offer it because we have such a tiny building? And she noticed that the city owned like 50 square feet of beach space on this lake, this big lake in town, which was overgrown because they didn't use it as the public beach anymore. They used the, the other side of the beach. And so she got a grant together and she got a bunch of kayaks and you can borrow a kayak from the library. <laughs> you, you go to the library and you give them your library card and they give you a life jacket and a paddle and a key and you go to the lake and you unlock one of these kayaks and then you can paddle around all day in the kayak. And a kayak is something that's like fun to use, but like you don't need to own one because like mm. you're going to use it three days a year, or five days a year, or 10 days a year, not going to use it 365 days a year. Right. So that's one of the things that libraries are really good at is like buying expensive things that you don't need all the time, but it's great to have available for you. Yeah. All right, well, we ready blunt. to uh, take it to the blunt? Yeah, Let's take it to the blunt. All right, we're gonna take it to the Philly blunt. We're gonna hit you rapid fire questions, rapid fire answers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> all right, uh, here we go, let's get it started. Uh, what are you reading right now? Uh, House of or Leaves. Oh. House of Thieves? House of Leaves, Mark Leaves. Zalanduski, <laughs> whatever, it begins with a Z. You mentioned uh, Def Leppard in your email. What is your favorite Def Leppard record? 
hysteria, pyromania, or high and dry. And yes, I did Google those. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly Googled high and dry. <laughs> so it's, it's pyromania because that's the only one I bought when I was in high school when they were popular. This one uh, looks like it has the coolest cover, so. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I was uh, at, It's the I, blunt, man. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I was at live. If we're, if we're talking Def Leppard. I just want to Here say, we go. <laughs> I was at live a and there was every artist there was fresh prince there was jay-z there was i mean all the way to jars of clay whatever mm -hmm. whatever your music was they had your man there and and freaking def leppard was the best out of all of them they <laughs> flew the roof off of live eight and if anybody was there that will back me up on that i'll tell you right now no no one's backing you all. <laughs> i saw them in their heyday they weren't great <laughs> um, so I've known Kyle has photographed a lot of bands for me and other bands throughout the country. Give me a musical artist or band you wish you could photograph. Ramstein. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I'd love to photograph Ramstein. With the flames and the fire. Yeah. I'd be like, you know, why don't you guys like strap lawnmowers to your chests and crash into each other? <laughs> and they would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so while we're on quarantine, what are you watching that you'd recommend somebody else watch? We just, I, I just discovered yesterday for some reason that, um, there was a Terminator movie that I didn't know about, um, uh, Dark Fate, Terminator Dark Fate. <laughs> and we watched it and I was like, this is amazing. It, it was great. Terminator Dark Fate was wonderful. Um, I haven't been, uh, binge watching stuff as I feel like I just don't have I don't have the time to give to binge watching something. Right. Mm. Um, I, I think that Lost years ago <laughs> burned me out and taught me a valuable lesson at the same time that, mm -hmm. you know, while I was watching the show, I'm like, what is the end of this? What is the end of this? When I got to the end, I realized that, that they didn't know in the beginning what the end was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, it's if like you don't part. know what the answer to the mystery is, is don't hook me up in your nonsense right right yeah so, <laughs> i have not really binge watched uh anything during this i've watched a few movies all right watch tiger king go ahead <laughs> oh my gosh. do you prefer pool or air hockey oh good question yeah i i, I bought a pool table once uh because the thrift store had it um and it was a great when a great thing when i got it and it was also great when i finally got rid of it yeah uh, yeah it's pretty uh, cool in the beginning you stand there with the pool stick and you look cool yeah you know? <laughs> yeah I, I think i think pool probably rather than air hockey because i'm you look I'm cool sharp in it yeah i'm a slower person <laughs> yeah i think pool okay uh scotch or bourbon it totally depends no 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 pick an answer well um I love the Lafroig ten year old single malt Isle Scotch. I mean right. if I could have one thing to drink, that would be it. But I mean if you get a mediocre scotch and a mediocre bourbon, in fact, in our house, we call it scurbin when you have some mediocre scotch left and some mediocre bourbon left and you just put them together in the same glass he's yeah, like what are you drinking and you say scurban it means there was you know a half inch of each <laughs> that was that would be the start of a dark night for me man <laughs> <laughs> well you only do it when there's none left you don't start out that way. Right, okay i got you all right. you end with it and then you go to bed that's right right yeah. so i had three beers and some scurban and went to bed <laughs> Uh, what, um, who was a teacher that uh, changed your life? Josephine Duggan in, she's my sixth grade teacher. She was fascinated by Egypt. We did a, a, like a semester on ancient Egypt. We did a play where I played King Ramses. Uh, it was a, it was an Egyptian funeral. So there was a, there was a, I mean, mummy. you look just like a Ramses when I think yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. And... <laughs> We went to the, she took us to the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Philadelphia, and we saw the Sphinx there, and we saw the mummies there, and my life changed, like, in that, in that year, and if it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't have done many of the things that I did, and I did end up going to Egypt and photographing Zahi Hawass for a magazine article and going inside the uh -oh. pyramids and spending a a week there with archaeologists 
Mm. And she gave me a Christmas ornament. She gave everybody in the class a Christmas ornament. And they had our names engraved on them. And to this day, the only Christmas ornament that I am actually interested in putting on the tree is the one that she gave me with my name on it. That's awesome. And then my wife can decorate the tree mm. however she wants. Yeah. Cool. She sounds like an awesome teacher, man. She was, she's very good. She's still around. Cool. Am I up? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what is the context of the oldest photo, personal photo that you own in your possession? Oh, wow. Obviously not going to ask you to go find it, but like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure it must be a, a picture of somebody in my family. My grandfather mm -hmm. had a, mm -hmm. uh, gave me my first camera. Yeah. And taught me, he was an engineer and he was very interested in f-stops and apertures and film <laughs> speeds and the very engineering precise things of it so i'm sure it was a picture that i took of a family member and i'm sure it was on a tripod and i'm sure it was very sharp and probably completely devoid of yeah. any emotion or character yeah i just want to add because i know we're just trying to wrap up but but like my, my grandmother my aunts they all have these like just trunks full of old photos and i just that's something that i'll never have and i kind of regret that that you know Times change, but I think it's so cool to look through those photos, man. Like that's one of my favorite things to do whenever so one of those photo albums come out, you know? You have so a this phone is full what? of photos. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the same. It's not this that feel and smell, you know? Yeah. I, when this I go is to the why, picture, so go ahead. This is why though I wanna do portraits of people with their masks on. So that when you know your grandchildren are looking through your photos. Yeah. I'll say, why are you wearing this mask? Say, <laughs> Let me tell you about the the fall of 2020. Yeah. When... So can you can you to capture this moment? Can you take a picture of me, me and me and the mad scientist with our mask on via Zoom? Um, I don't. I wouldn't count that. Um, okay. Yeah. Because you know I'd want to control the light and you know whatever, but um. We could yeah, certainly we got, like we got say, filters that'll handle. Never mind. We'll do it with filters. <laughs> but you know, we could say like, oh, we're gonna um, meet in uh, Rittenhouse Square, you know, and All do right. it there. So I've I've been thinking of like ways that I could offer that to my neighborhood and say like, you know, I'm gonna pick a place, you know, meet me here. You stand way over there. I'll stand way over here. Yeah. Get our yeah. exercise. All right, I got a lot riding on this one. I, I, I'm feeling you're with me here. Tom Hanks or Kevin Costner? <laughs> so, I think Kevin Costner's just out the window. Uh, oh no! Yeah, Come on. There, there's not. There's no. That's yeah, not a. Yeah. That's not a Who's thing, on? man. That's not a thing. Yeah, that's not even. Yeah. That's I not can't. A thing. That's not a competition. That's like. I mean, I can't think of world? a thing yeah. that Kevin Costner no has done out? that I mm -hmm. liked. No but way I also, Greg, come on. Greg, Greg oh. to, to Greg's credit here, I also can't think of a thing that I think Tom Hanks did better than anybody else could have done. <laughs> oh, that's, his, that's his angle. He's the everyman. <laughs> so Tom Hanks, has, Tom Hanks has been in some good movies, but I don't think it's through any fault of his own. Um, I thought Saving Private Ryan was a terrific movie. I really, really like Saving Private Ryan. But every time I look at it, I'm like, that's Tom Hanks. And right. so it's always it Tom Hanks. It kind of, yeah, it kind of drags me from uh, the movie. But I also think that Tom Hanks seems to be an extraordinarily nice person. Mm -hmm. So well, I see his. I'm not saying he's not a nice person. I see his stuff on Twitter <laughs> every once in a while <laughs> when he goes viral actor. for, you know, finding somebody's wallet and returning it or something like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, that's like that's like saying, uh, who, who who do you like better, uh, Babe Ruth or Cesar Hernandez? I mean, it's yeah, just yeah, like yeah. What, what, yeah, are, yeah Tom what, Hanks what, is like what, Babe Ruth. What's the question? I mean, really? <laughs> let's let's give, give me a Kevin Costner. Obviously, you guys are not familiar with Costner's full catalog. <laughs> <laughs> I think Come that's on. a perfect. I think this is a perfect place to end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so with me and Greg angry at each other. <laughs> About Kevin Costner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Per usual. Yeah. It doesn't take much. All right. Well, thank you so much, Colin. Can you give us your uh, shout out, Your uh, where people can reach you, um, where people can see you? Yeah, you can find everything at KyleCassidy.com. So my Instagram, my Insta everything's Kyle Cassidy. So Instagram's Kyle Cassidy. Twitter's Kyle Cassidy. 
but it's all in, and if you if you happen to be a nurse or a doctor or somebody in the healthcare profession who I should photograph um, please hit me up or if you're doing something else that in 50 years people should look back and remember please let me know about it and I would love to photograph you thank you cool, cool. awesome appreciate your time man thank you so Peace much Kyle. great appreciate you yep take it easy man thanks and to somehow <laughs>